So after a memorable WrestleMania 30, a pretty good post-WrestleMania Raw, and a pretty good addition of NXT this week, it was up to WWE to continue the trend of good shows coming out of WrestleMania 30 and do that with SmackDown this week. Did they do it? Well, let's find out. Before I get on to reviewing this edition of SmackDown, I do want to talk about the big news story of the week, which was, of course, the untimely passing of the Osmo Warrior dying, I believe, aged 55 on the Tuesday this week, the day after he appeared on Raw in a promo segment. And I must admit, from a fan point of view, from a personal point of view, I don't really have all that much to say about this because I wasn't around when Osmo Warrior was big. I wasn't around when he was a star. I wasn't really a fan of his, mainly because I wasn't really able to be a fan of his because I just wasn't really into wrestling back when he was a massive star in the WWF and of course when he came over to WCW for a little while. So I don't really have that much to say from an emotional standpoint, but if I grew up in that era, I may have had some totally different things to say about it, but it's been all over the news uh, in the UK especially. When I came home from work, my mum said to me, and I quote, Dan, are you depressed? Did you see that wrestler, the Ultimate Warrior, died? That's what she said to me. So even my mum knew about this whole thing, and she knows nothing and doesn't get involved in wrestling at all, which shows you how big a news this was and how big a personality, in my opinion, the Ultimate Warrior was. Now, I know he was a big star for WWE and probably less so for WCW. So if you have any memories of Ultimate Warrior, you know, which you can pass on to me, please give me them. You know, I've seen some of his great matches against Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan, etc. And, you know, when he won the IC Championship, against Honga Jock Man in about under a minute. I've seen all of his good matches. Um, just a shame I was never really around during his period to become a fan of his. And, you know, like I said, it was a real tragedy, if anything, the timing of when the Ultimate Warrior died. You know, the day after he appeared on Raw, you know, after he'd been in the Hall of Fame as the headliner. But maybe, you know, in some kind of strange way, it was the ultimate send-off for the Osmo Warrior. You know, he patched up a lot of differences between him and some people, you know, backstage, like Vincent Mann and people like that. He went into the Hall of Fame, which I, a lot of people's wishes were for him to go in the Hall of Fame. That promo on Raw and what he talked about in there and talking about, you know, the older fans, you know, picking the legends and, you know, the Osmo Warrior living and everyone else and etc. kind of felt like he was kind of predicting his death, you know, just a tad to me. Um, but, you know... Give me your uh, tributes to Ultimate Warrior in the comment section below. And it looks like WWE are going to be doing a tribute show for the Ultimate Warrior as well on next week's edition of Raw. My condolences go out to his wife and two daughters and any member of family and any friend of his because this must be a tough time, especially you know when a death comes at such an untimely time such as that. And with that said now, let's move on to this week's edition of SmackDown. So we open up the show with John Cena, and did you notice how different his reaction was to SmackDown as it was on Raw, where they were pretty much just singing along to his theme music saying, John Cena sucks! John Cena sucks! And he even kind of acknowledged it in here, but here you can see the canned heat is flowing all around the arena, and they're cutting out those boos for John Cena, even though you can still kind of hear them over the canned heat, they're that damn loud now, WWE. So Cena comes out and pretty much says that the future is now. He is the measuring stick and they've got to get through him first. Well, John Cena, I have a little bone to pick with you. Actually, it's quite a big bone. If the future is now, Cena, why the hell couldn't you have put Bray Wyatt over at WrestleMania, a new star? It wouldn't really have affected you if you'd lost at WrestleMania. So why the fuck did you have to win at WrestleMania? I know you don't have creative control. Maybe you do. I don't know. And it's essentially Vince's decision. But it would have made so much more sense to have Bray Wyatt go over at WrestleMania. And then it would have been so much. It would have been something interesting, not just to do with the John Cena character, but it would have been logical storytelling and logical feud advancement. And then John Cena could have gone over at Extreme Rules and finished the feud that way. Instead, you deprive Bray Wyatt of a memorable WrestleMania moment, and essentially the record books are going to remember Bray Wyatt losing to John Cena. Yes, it may have raised his profile, but at the end of the day, it's the same old shit. Going back to John Cena. Um, you know, the, on the time, John, you have Bray Wyatt saying he's still trying to bring out the monster in Cena, which is all fine and good, but you kind of failed at WrestleMania. Which is why this feud continuing. I don't mind it continuing, but if Bray Wyatt went over WrestleMania, I'd be so much more interested in this feud than I am quite now. When Cesaro vs. Big Show was announced on Raw this week, I was really excited for this match, simply because of the moment that happened at WrestleMania with Cesaro body slamming uh, Big Show over the top rope. I was looking forward to seeing this match just because of what happened at WrestleMania, and I was interested to see how these two would work in the ring. So it's fair enough. I was really excited for this after the opening segment. I was thinking, what better way to continue on the show? 
Having Cesaro versus Big Show, I thought this could be at least our main event. But Hogan was on the show. Maybe even main event. But Daniel Bryan was on the show. So after the opener, okay, John Cena was also on the show. So there's three big spots to fill. And you've given Cesaro the, you know, after the opener segment. Okay, fair enough. Um, I must admit, I was expecting a little bit more from this match. I don't know why. I just I watched this match and I was just kind of like, come on, uh, surely the pace is going to pick up soon. The pace is going to pick up soon. And it never really did. And I was really expecting more of a showcase of, for Cesaro here, but we never really got it until after Swagger came out and caused the DQ. And then you have Cesaro neutralizing Big Show, which was pretty cool in my opinion. We've seen him neutralize Carly. Now we've seen him neutralize Big Show. The next step for this, do the Cesaro swing on Big Show, and that would be really cool. But uh, it all all the good stuff happened after the DQ finish. I was like, in this match, it would have been a really good time to showcase Cesaro, but just didn't feel like we were really getting that. I understand he's up against the Big Show, and you know you don't want to make Big Show look too weak because he's a legit seven-foot giant, etc. But I just would have expected a little bit more feats of strength here from Cesaro to really showcase himself, especially after he's done that big babyface turn at WrestleMania and winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. I guess my only question really here about Cesaro is, is his future as a face or a heel? Because if they were going to push him as a face, why have they aligned him with Paul Heyman? You know, at the time, I was thinking, you know, this whole Paul Heyman guy thing is kind of good, but Paul Heyman is associated with Brock Lesnar, who everyone hates for ending the Undertaker streak, some fans saying bullshit on it, etc. And now he's managing a babyface Cesaro. It's kind of... Odd how that is going to work. I guess if there's one character in WWE who can go from most hated to most liked, it's Paul Heyman. But will it affect Cesaro's ability to get over as a babyface? Considering, you know, a lot of people probably wanted to just see him go out on his own and see how he does there. You know, as for this feud with Jack Swagger, um, you know, it's a good introductory feud for a Cesaro. I imagine they'll have a match at Extreme Rules, which will be used to put Cesaro over. So, you know, this feud is looking pretty good. It's like Schleg Daddy said in his Raw review. Sometimes the best feuds are when tag teams break up, as there is just an immediate personal issue there. So on this week's edition of SmackDown, we had an appearance by the icon, the Hulkster, Hulk Hogan himself. And who did he introduce to the ring? None other than our new, yes, 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 WWE World Heavyweight Champion, Daniel Bryan. I imagine this has been a pretty damn cool week for Daniel Bryan. He wins the WWE World Heavyweight Championship by beating Batista, Orton, and Triple H in one night and overcoming the authority in an eight-month-long storyline, main eventing WrestleMania as well, you know, what he did on Raw, and now he's in the same ring as Hulk Hogan. Man, Daniel Bryan must be living all his fucking dreams now. You know, he's, he said he wanted to main event WrestleMania. Being in the same ring as Hulk Hogan, that must have been pretty damn iconic for him. You know, I kind of wish, though, this was more about Hogan putting over Daniel Bryan rather than Bryan putting over Hulk Hogan. But I can kind of look past that. You know, when you have Hogan doing the yes chants, etc., and all that kind of stuff, and doing, you know, the Daniel Bryan taunts, and then, you know, Daniel Bryan and Hulk Hogan doing the usual Hulk Hogan stuff that he does in the ring, and even though Daniel Bryan looked kind of stupid and awkward doing Hogan's stick and his, you know, movements and everything, I still thought it was a pretty cool moment that you have Daniel Bryan go in there with Hulk Hogan and tear this joint apart, and the crowd were going mental for this one. You've got Hulk, Hulk Hogan, who's generally over, with Daniel Bryan, who's the most over guy in the company. You know the crowd are going to go mental for that one, and it was a pretty cool moment as well. There was four matches on this edition of SmackDown which I really don't have enough time to really dedicate their own segment to so I'm just going to put them all in one segment. Los Matadores versus Ryback Baxel. You know these two were involved in the WrestleMania pre-show. Both lost of course the Tag Team Championship match. Ryback Baxel get the win here. Okay nothing really more to say about it. RVD had another match against Damian Sandow which is pretty much there to establish his return to WWE and give him some wins as to you know whatever he's going to do. Pretty much the same result as Raw and the same you know Damian Sandow got a little bit more in an RVD on Smackdown though which I did kind of like you know saying Damian Sandow right now is going nowhere it's a real shame. I guess my real question here is what are they going to be doing with RVD? Are they going to make him, you know, are they going to make him put him in the mid card? I guess that's what they're going to do. Who are they going to feud him with? You know, I'm just curious as to what they're going to do. Bad News Barrett had a match against Kofi Kingston and he won really quickly. Considering it's Kofi Kingston, he won in like two minutes, a minute maybe. And, you know, this to me feels very similar to the push he was getting when he got his Barrett barrage, when he defeated loads of jobbers and then had a feud with Randy Orton. You know, you start off by defeating a few jobbers, establishing the character, and then trying to build that character up with feuds with some people, etc. 
I guess my only thing is, you know, they've tried pushing him so many times and it just never has worked. So do I have confidence WWE going to push this guy properly? Damn right I fucking well don't. Santino Morella versus Fandango. Boy, I'm tired to see these two guys face off in like, mixed tags or in singles matches. I'm just going to be a bit sick of it now. Although Layla being Fandango's new girl, I'm down with because Layla is hot. And I think Fandango won here. Yeah, Fandango won. You know, whatever. I'm just not too bothered about this feud really right now. So we had a video package for Paige and a video package highlighting the segment which happened between her and AJ on Raw. Now I'm perfectly happy, as I've said many times, with the way Paige was booked and how she got introduced and won the Divas Championship on her first night. One thing I wasn't happy about, though, was the way they presented Paige's character. It just didn't feel the same as, you know, she'd be presented on an NXT you know, which is important that you establish a character when someone's debuting on an edition of Raw after WrestleMania and winning the Divas Championship. In my opinion, you've had her win the belt now. I was kind of expecting her to have a match on SmackDown so we can kind of see a little bit of her. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched NXT, you know, now it's time to start developing her character. And her character is like this anti-Diva ass kicker. So WWE, please do her justice and establish this character. Yes, her acting skills aren't great, her mic skills aren't great, but she is really, really talented and deserves at least a good run with this Divas Championship and a good introductory to being on the roster. And she's 20 fucking one. So you're going to have so many years ahead of this girl and you're going to have so many years of this talent if you're going to use her properly in the Divas Division. In the future, she could be a staple of that Divas Division. I am not kidding when I say that. And then we get to our main event of the evening, which is Daniel Bryan and the Usos versus Batista, Orton, and Kane. A combination of, I guess, evolution and the fucking authority. After, you know, and it kind of makes sense now with what happened between the Usos and Batista and Orton on Raw. They were trying to promote this main event for SmackDown. As for the match itself, you know, I didn't really pay too much attention to the match. I assumed the big thing would happen after the match with the storyline advancement here. You had all hell breaking loose and the match is called a DQ when the heels are beating down the faces. Out come the shield to attack Kane. Autumn Batista roll out of the ring. So you're imagining now that the shield are going to be six-man tag action at Extreme Rules against Autumn Batista and Kane. You know, that kind of feels like the direction they're going with it. Unless they involve Triple H in there and have either Orton or Batista go after the WWE Whatever Weight Championship and get their rematch at Extreme Rules. That seems like the way they're going. But it's really interesting now. You know, you've had pretty much the same ending to SmackDown as you had with Raw. Daniel Bryan and The Shield ending the show on top. And it'll be interesting to see, number one, who faces Daniel Bryan at Extreme Rules? You know, I was thinking kind of Brock Lesnar, but I think that would be a better match to say for a SummerSlam. So it'll either be Randy Orton or Batista. My guess it will be Randy Orton because he was the champion. Hell, it could even be fucking Triple H. We put himself in the championship match on Raw. There's no stopping himself getting another pay-per-view payout by putting himself on WWE's fourth biggest pay-per-view of the year, which now is Extreme Rules, not Survivor Series. Um, also, it'd be interesting to see what they've got lined up for The Shield and what kind of match they're going to be in. Um, you know, who they're going to go up against. Batista, Orton, Triple H. Batista, Orton, and Kane. Um, you know, who are they going to be going up against? I imagine they're probably going to put Triple H in there and have one of Batista or Orton go after the championship. Kind of, you know, maybe my thinking here. But it'll be another, you know, it'll probably be the semi-main event now, spotlighting the Shield in such a way. And I'm very pleased because the Shield is one of the best thing, best factions that WWE have built up in quite some time. And it seems like this, the steam is continuing with the Shield. And when they do eventually break out as single stars, they're going to have such a damn good foundation to go off that they're going to be really likely to actually probably go on and be stars. And usually I have no confidence in WWE booking their own stars. So what The Shield are doing right now in WWE, what Daniel Bryan is going to be doing, I am quite interested to see where they're going to go with those views. And we've got some views, you know, we've got Cena and Wyatt is continuing. Cesaro and Swagger is, you know, keeps going. So there's a... There's a Decent amount of other feuds going on in the show. Yes, there was a little bit of filler in this SmackDown, but I thought this SmackDown was pretty decent this week, at best, in my opinion. Uh, if you have any comments about the show, please let me know down in the comment section below about the show and you know how you feel WWE are going to move forward with Daniel Bryan. Do you feel they, they'll book him as a legit champion, or do you feel they'll do like a Miz or someone like that and just treat him like a second-rate champion? You know, not be in the main events, be outdone by Cena. Because right now. 
it seems like John Cena really isn't playing that big of a part in the WWE. I mean, he was in a mid-card match at WrestleMania. He was on the you know the segment after the opener on the WrestleMania post WrestleMania edition of Raw. He opened this SmackDown show, and Daniel Bryan has main evented all those shows. So, do you have confidence that they're going to be booking Daniel Bryan? as a legit champion going forward. I sure hope they do, but right now it doesn't really seem like Cena is going to be in that big main event spot right now, which I guess frees Daniel Bryan up to be in that spot, as him and John Cena are definitely going to be the top two baby faces in the WWE right now. So it's been a very good week for WWE, apart from the streak ending and the untimely passing of Ultra Warrior, of course, and perhaps maybe a smaller one, John Cena beating Bray Wyatt, etc. It's been a good week for WWE. Let's hope they continue that momentum going into Extreme Rules and further and highlight newer stars in the WWE and build up some newer stars in the WWE. Fingers fucking crossed. It's about damn time. So if you have any comments on the show, like I said, Comment below. I'll be here same time next week to review next week's edition of SmackDown. Thank you very much for watching if you have and goodbye.